Hi, I'm Professor Gabriel Lozada, and this is an introduction to Econ 4010 Intermediate Microeconomics at the University of Utah. For those of you who might not be familiar with the campus, the uh, University of Utah uh, picture is uh, surrounding the window in which you can see me on this video. Uh, an a historical term for intermediate microeconomics, for microeconomics in general, is price theory. And this is because one of the main questions we try to answer in intermediate microeconomics is if a certain object, let's say this pen, sells for a certain amount of money, why is that? In other words, the prices, the objects that we have around us sell at different prices. Why do they sell at these prices? What is it about the economy that generates the prices that we see in the marketplace? This is an example of positive economics. That is, a positive question is the question of what we observe something in the real world, why is it the way it is? That's to be distinguished from a normative economic question, which is how should things be? How ought they to be? The first uh, research in economics, or what we might call economics now, was the medieval scholastics connected with the Roman Catholic Church who developed a doctrine called Just Price. This was a normative doctrine about what prices ought to be. So that, for example, if there were a natural disaster, the free market would generate much higher prices for some commodities, and that might be inconsistent with their notion of the just uh, price, which is what prices ought to be, so that, let's say, victims of n natural disasters don't get, as they would put it, or as they might put it, taking advantage of. Now, just as in most things in economics, there are two sides to that story. One of the advantages of having prices rise in natural disasters if, is that it gives large incentives for people to bring needed supplies to the stricken area. Another uh, older notion, uh, normative notion of economics has to do with whether it's appropriate to charge interest on loans. There's a, theor a theory going back, or a school of thought going back a long ways that, say that says that it's inappropriate to charge interest or to charge high interest on loans. This has given rise in the Islamic world to the notion of Islamic banking, where economic activity is financed not by debt, which you'd have to pay interest on, but rather by equity, that is, shares of stock, where interest is not paid. We'll skip the next school of thought, in uh, our next two schools of, of thought in economics, who were the mercantilists and the physiocrats. We'll skip to the classical economists, started by Adam Smith, writing The Wealth of Nations in 1776, and then later on in the early 1800s, economists like Ricardo, Malthus, mid-1800s, Karl Marx. They developed what's called a labor theory of value to explain price theory, to explain why prices are the way they are. The idea behind the labor theory of value is that labor is the ultimate cost of production, that if you want to uh, manufacture something like a pen, you have direct labor that's involved in the manufacture of the pen, plus indirect labor that's involved in the manufacture of the machines that are involved in the manufacture of the pen, or labor that's involved in making the machines that then make the machines that make the pen. The labor theory of value says that when you add up all the direct plus indirect labor involved in making a commodity, you get that commodity's price. In other words, if one thing is has twice as much direct plus indirect labor as another, then it would sell for twice as much. This is a theory of price that just involves the cost of production. Now, you may think that labor theory of value is a normative theory, but the way these economists were using it, even Marx, was as a positive theory. They weren't saying that the working class, the laboring class, generates all wealth and therefore they should get all wealth. The notion of Marx's notion of exploitation of labor is certainly important, but had nothing to do with the fact that he was using the labor theory of value. The neoclassical economic school starts in roughly the 1880s with, with Alfred Marshall. Other people were involved with this as well. Uh, Jevons, for example, Mill. And Marshall said it's not enough to have just the cost of production. 
You also need to know something about the demand for a commodity in order to figure out what its price is. It's the neoclassical theory of price that we're basically going to be studying this semester, the one that requires both supply and demand. How good is that theory? Well, we've only been working on economics a few hundred years, so feels like physics are much older. Aristotle was working on physics more than 2,000 years ago. And so economics is still in a fairly primitive state. Therefore, the neoclassical school, while it can explain some things, it can't explain everything. There are colleagues of mine here in the economics department of the University of Utah who don't use neoclassical economics. They use other approaches to economic analysis. Other approaches in microeconomics would include institutional economics, connected with the name of Thorstein Veblen, who was writing around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, there's also uh, Marxist economics, of course. And there are other schools of economic thought that we won't talk about this semester, but that can be more useful than neoclassical economics in analyzing some economic questions. So I think humility is an important aspect of studying the economy. And that's the context in which I included on your, in your syllabus the quote from Joan Robinson. Joan Robinson worked in roughly the mid-20th century. She was a colleague of John Maynard Keynes. And the quote that I have in the syllabus says, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. This shows both that economists don't have all the answers, but that it, some economists, unfortunately, pretend or act as if they did have all the answers. And so one of the most important things that we're doing this semester is explicating, for example, the fact that demand and supply is not a law of nature. Aristotle wasn't dumb because he didn't know about demand curves and supply curves or couldn't figure them out for himself. These are economic theories. They work in some contexts and don't work in other contexts. And the more you know about them, the more you understand when it's appropriate to use them and when it's inappropriate to use them. And unfortunately, some economists do use them in contexts in which they're inappropriate, sometimes just because they don't know anything else about other schools of economic thought and what those schools can contribute to the problem. So they may be using neoclassical tools when the assumptions don't work, when they aren't, when they aren't appropriate. Quick sketch of what we're going to be doing in this course. We'll spend the first part of the course setting demand, the second part of the course setting supply, then we'll put demand and supply together to get equilibrium, and then we'll do some other miscellaneous topics. Now, one natural reaction might be, well, we've already studied demand and supply in principles of economics. What else, what else is there to know about demand and supply? But actually, uh, demand and supply curves are not really obvious. Sorry about that interruption. I was saying demand and supply curves are not completely obvious. Think about demand. When I'm teaching principles, I don't have much time to develop demand curves. And so I do it just on an intuitive level. I ask students, well, if the price of something goes up, would you, let's say the price of apples go up, would you buy more apples or less apples? And students will say they buy less apples. And so I draw a graph with price going up and quantity, going, quantity demand going down, and that generates a downward sloping demand curve. But that's actually only superficially satisfactory. Why, when price goes up, do you demand less of something? When I ask this of students, they'll come up with considerations like, well, I have limited income, and so when the price goes up, it's hard to afford something. They'll say, when the price goes up, I might switch from apples to some other fruit, let's say pears. And it has to do with how much I really like apples or don't particularly like apples. So the last is a psychological effect. The one before was a comparison between apples and other commodities. So other commodities are also important. It's not just apples, even though it's just the price of apples that went up. And finally, there was, an in it was a consideration of income, how much money you can afford. And so then the question is, how do all these things come together to generate downward sloping demand curves. 
And I think you can see that is by no means obvious. And what we'll be, what we'll be doing this semester, in fact, what we'll be doing right now, after we do the, the short stuff on mathematics when we, get into, when we get into consumer theory, is to see how all those things put together generate downward sloping demand curves under certain assumptions. And if the assumptions don't hold, then you actually don't get downward sloping demand curves. So that's where we're going to be going in this course.